welcome to our latest episode of Extreme Reloading. I'm calling this episode our season finale. And that's not because I'm not going to do these things anymore. No, on the contrary, I've got some things planned for the future of Extreme Reloading. So, before we get into this episode, let me ask you to vote. I've set up a little poll and I'd like you to vote on what we're going to cover in the next season of Extreme Reloading starting about this winter. So, would you like to see our next video on pistols? Like this 1911 45 ACP? Or would you like to see our next series of Extreme Reloading on the 556? For something like this Tavor, Mini 14, or the AR-15? Cast your vote with the poll tool and we'll leave this thing open throughout the summer. Now in this episode we're going to continue talking about reloading very precise ammunition for the Ruger Precision Rifle in 308 Winchester. Now, this information can be used to craft precision ammunition for any rifle whatsoever. I just happen to be using Ruger's Precision Rifle. So let me start with a recap of this season. We've spent a lot of time and effort talking about case preparation and that's extremely important. We covered that in episode 2 and that included full length resizing, primer pocket preparations, flash hole preparation, trimming, chamfering, the whole nine yards. In episode three we continued working on our cases and did some very important case sorting. And let me stress once again, if you're not sorting your cases, you're missing out on achieving just a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better precision and accuracy out of your rifles. In episode four we covered primers, powder, and bullets, oh my, and we talked about Varget and uh, RL-15. We had another very important episode in episode 7. In that episode we explored the effect of bullet jump or combined overall length and bullet seating depth on accuracy precision. And what we found with this particular Ruger precision rifle is that it doesn't like those bullets seated very very close to the lands. In fact, my optimal accuracies and looking at the trend of my accuracies, uh, I achieved the best accuracy at a combined overall length of 2.79 inches. In episode 8, we took a look at exterior ballistics, looked at a couple of online ballistic calculators, compared them, and uh, had some fun with that. Well, today we're ready to talk about optimal charge weight, OCW, and specifically we're going to be looking for what we call the SIL in that optimal charge weight testing process. So let me lay the groundwork for this thing. Before we do optimal charge weight comparisons or analysis, we need to really have decided on the bullet, the bullet seating depth, and ideally the, uh, the case that we're going to be using. Now if you've got very well prepared cases, the optimal charge weight will work out all the better for you, even if you don't have uh, a decision made on which case you're going to be using, this whole process will still be very, very beneficial for you for developing uh, a very accurate, well precise load. Remember precision and accuracy really are two different things, but as far as I'm concerned, if I can get the precision out of my loads, out of my groups, then I can move that group to achieve the accuracy and hit the bullseye. So what is optimal charge weight all about? First of all it focuses on the powder and the powder charge. And it's this whole idea of taking a given case and asking how full should I make this case to achieve optimal results. Well, I guess we should define the word optimal. And what we're looking for, first of all, is extremely consistent muzzle velocities. If I can keep pushing the bullets out of that muzzle at about the same velocity, or ideally at exactly the same velocity, then downrange, that's going to pay benefits. Now, it may not be too apparent at 100, 200, or even 300 yards. But we start stretching that out to four, five, six, seven hundred yards, and that effort is going to really start paying off. 
The second thing we need to consider when we're defining optimal is that we're actually trying to achieve a certain muzzle velocity. And in this case, we're looking for about 2600 feet per second out of the muzzle. Now, if we recall back to the previous episode of Extreme Reloading, where we talked about those uh, ballistic calculators, you saw that if we can launch a bullet out of the muzzle at about 2600 feet per second, that at, at least the warmer temperature ranges, we can achieve um, supersonic velocities out to, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred yards in, uh, in some cases. Once we go transonic at, you know, oftentimes 800, 900 yards with a 308 Winchester, uh, for me, the game is up. I don't even pursue shooting at that range because we've exceeded that round's maximum effective range. And now back to optimal charge weight and what we call the sill. So what we're going to do is we are going to load these cases, and these happen to be Lapua cases, we're going to load them at two tenths of a grain increments. And we're going to fire these things over a chronograph. And what we're expecting to see is, of course, as the powder charge increases, the velocity is going to increase in a similar way. But at some point along that string of rounds that we're going to fire, we're probably going to see where one given charge gives us essentially or maybe exactly the same velocity of the next given charge that's 0.2 tenths of a grain higher. That point is the sill. And what that means is that with these cases, and probably even with other cases, that we have found the optimal charge weight. So even though a given case is slightly different on interior case capacity, it doesn't make a difference. We're still sending the bullet out of the muzzle at the same velocity. You see how that's important? Now why don't I do this earlier? Because I haven't decided on bullet seating depth, the powder I'm going to be using, etc, etc. So now it's time to finalize this thing with optimal charge weight and seeking the sill. Let's take a look at some of the results on the computer. Let me walk you through what I did here. First of all, I have used two different powders. This is Reloader 15 and Varget. Now based on past experience uh, and the reloading data made available by Alliant and Hodgden, uh, I know some general um, charge ranges that will work for this rifle. Since I am using a relatively short combined overall length with a relatively long bullet, that means that that bullet is occupying more of the case capacity than other bullets. Uh, I know that I cannot run a full charge. A uh, full charge of Varget is about 46 grains and that would be compressed. Um, but uh, I know that I can't go above 44 just from, again, past experience of using this powder in this uh, load development process. So I've decided to drop it down to 42.2 in both cases and then work it up in these two tenths of a grain increments up to 44 in both cases. Now during the loading process, what I'm doing is as I am actually loading this case, I'm checking it off that we have uh, completed the load and then I'm actually sealing that individual cartridge in a explicitly labeled envelope. I've showed that before as a nice way to be very, very systematic, very, very careful, very safe with the reloading uh, practices. What I learned though is even though I wanted to load out to 44 grains, I did not load 43.6, 43.8, and 44 uh, because that was, that was uh, compressing already at that point. In fact, I could hear the powder, I'll call it crunching, as I was seeding that bullet uh, starting at about 43 grains, 43.2, 43.4. Uh, so I stopped there. Uh, I always avoid uh, compressed loads. Some folks shoot those things no problem, but that's not uh, what I do. I got a similar thing with Varget. In fact, I was hearing the crunching even earlier with Varget. It's a little bit 
uh, different volume of, of powder, and so I stopped there at 43.2 grains. And then I fired those over the chronograph, starting again at 42.2, and then very carefully working these things up, noting the velocity at each step. Now I fired these things at an ambient air temperature of 91 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's pretty warm out there. And the blue line represents the velocities that I'm getting with RL15, Reloader 15. The orange line is with Varget. Now, isn't this interesting? Here is the sill we're looking for. And what's very interesting is that it happens to be in the same exact place for both powders. Now, it's the same cases. It's the same uh, bullet seated in exactly the same way, but yet two different powders. And we're seeing this sill up here between 42.8 and 43 grains. So that means that if I loaded at 42.9, actually with either one of these powders, that I could have some variability in the actual powder charge, some variability in the case uh, capacities, and yet I'll be getting about the same, or I will be getting the same muzzle velocities. Now earlier I said, you know, I'm shooting for um, 2600 feet per second and I'm really not going to be able to achieve that with a 42, let's say 42.9 um, grains of either Varget or, or RL15. So now I'm wondering with this slightly reduced muzzle velocity, 2,578 feet per second, um, how is that going to affect my capabilities or my ability to shoot long range with this rifle? So I've returned to uh, the, uh, the applied ballistics calculator and I'm using that one today because it gives me very quickly the information that uh, I want to look at and it also includes um, the Sierra 168 grain tipped Match King, which the Hornady 4 degrees of freedom or Ford off uh, ballistics uh, calculator does not at this time. So I plugged in all my pertinent information. And one thing very, very nice about this uh, Sierra Match King, the tipped Sierra Match King, is that it has a very high ballistic coefficient. And uh, 257 or 0.257 for a G7 ballistic coefficient is very high, very, very nice. Uh, plug in all the rest of my information and uh, generated the range card uh, to run out to 1,000 yards at 50 yard increments. What I'm looking for here is this point, the Mach, or we could look at the velocity itself. And remember that transonic velocity comes in at 1.2 through 0 0.8 um, Mach. And so we can actually retain supersonic speeds out to 950 yards, which is a very long shot with a 308 Winnie, um, and lose it probably around or go into the transonic range maybe about 975 yards. Somewhere, uh, somewhere in that range. Uh, still giving us nice 1,400 feet per second uh, muzzle velocity all the way up to 950. And you know, I'm really liking these numbers here. This is looking very, very promising. Now the question is uh, how it really performs out in the field. So now going back to the optimal charge weight uh, analysis, um, we're seeing a very, very nice sill being uh, created right here. I'm very happy with these results, especially because they agree with two different types of powder. And uh, this is what I'm going to be shooting for. I'm going to be loading 42.9 grains of RL15 or Varget. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Extreme Reloading.